This lesson will go over the basic notes and definitions for our first lesson on thermal concepts. Okay, the objectives that we'll cover in this first lesson are state that the temperature determines the direction of thermal energy transfer between two objects. I'll be referring to thermal energy as heat throughout these lessons. So um, what we're going to be looking at is heat transfer and its relationship to temperature. We will state the relation between the Kelvin and the Celsius scales of temperature. That's a fairly straightforward relation. State that the internal energy of a substance is the total potential energy and random kinetic energy of the molecules of the substance. Explain and distinguish between the macroscopic concepts of temperature, internal energy, and thermal energy, which I will be referring to as heat. And finally, we will define the mole and molar mass and the Avogadro constant, which may be familiar to those of you who have studied chemistry already. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll go over a demonstration of these con concepts using a simulation. All right, in this demonstration, we have a number of objects and um, we have a, a block of iron, a block of brick, a cup of water, and we have two heating elements over here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to check this energy symbols box. And what this does is it gives us an indication of how much energy is in each of these um, objects. What might be surprising is that there's energy. It doesn't appear to be any energy. It's a block that's sitting still. However, because of the vibration and motions of the particles within the objects and the forces of attraction between the particles in the objects, there is what we call internal energy in each of these objects. And what we can see straight away is that the objects have differing amounts of internal energy. The iron has six of these units of internal energy. The brick has only two and the water has uh, many. Now, um, all of these objects that should be stated are at the same temperature. They're all at room temperature at the moment because we haven't done any heating yet. Um, so we can place a thermometer to measure the temperature of each of these things. Um, and the first thing that we'll do is we, um, we'll just have a look and see what happens when we place two objects in what's called thermal contact. That means that now energy can pass from, from the brick into the iron and vice versa by a process called heat flow. Um, I'm going to just move this thermometer a little bit. Um, and you'll see that because these two objects are at the same temperature, no energy flows between them. We say that the two objects are in thermal equilibrium. In fact, all of these objects are in thermal equilibrium because they are all at the same temperature they're at room temperature, which means that no, temp no heat will flow between them. Uh, none of them will give uh, off any energy to any of the other ones. If we drop the iron into the water, again, we see that the water level rise as we displace the water with the iron, but we see that no energy flows from the iron to the water or vice versa. Okay, now I'll take the iron and place it on this heating element. And what I'd like to observe as we do this, let's see, yep, is um, the direction that heat flows as we turn the element on. So let's do that. So we can see that the element gives energy to the iron, heat flows into the iron until we reach some maximum temperature. Okay, so now we have iron at a very high temperature here because we've heated it up. We've We've moved heat from this heat source into the iron, um, and the internal energy of the iron has increased. However, the iron is now at a much higher temperature than its environment, and you can see that it's gradually giving off heat to the environment. So let's just heat it up again and fill it up. Um, and so there's only, a, there's only so much heat that we can give this thing before it starts giving off the energy as quickly as we're adding it. Um, what we'll do now is I'm going to take this heated iron, this iron with an excess of internal energy, 
This iron, which incidentally also is at a very high temperature, which you can see is dropping, but this iron is at a very high temperature, and I'm going to drop the iron into the water. And you'll see that the iron has a higher temperature than the water. And so the first time I do this, we'll just observe what happens to the energy in the iron. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 units of energy. I'll drop it in. We can see the energy leaves the iron. So heat is transferred from the iron into the water. And now that the whole system has become stable again, um, now that the iron is in thermal equilibrium with the water, we can see that the two temperatures have become equal. They're both now dropping because they're both now warmer than the environment. They're dropping quite gradually. Um, and we can see that the internal energy of the iron has decreased. We now only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight units of energy in here, whereas we started off with 13 before we dropped it in. And that energy has been given to the water. So the decrease in internal energy of the iron has resulted in an increase in the internal energy of the water. And the decrease of the internal energy of iron is equal to the increase in the internal energy of the water. Um, okay, so let's try again now. And let's have a closer look at what happens to the temperatures. So I'll heat the iron up. I'll give energy to the iron. So heat is transferred to the iron, which increases the internal energy of the iron. We'll then drop the iron back in and now have a look at the two thermometers. So the, the heat, the temperature of the iron drops rapidly, the temperature of the water increases gradually, and we reach thermal equilibrium at some temperature. Now, because the water had so much more internal energy to begin with than the iron, um, the change in temperature of the water is smaller than the change in temperature of the iron. So the iron drops by a larger amount than the water increases, um, even though the same amount of energy has been transferred away from the iron and into the water. Now that's because the what we call the thermal capacity of the water is much higher than the iron. But that's the subject of um, a later lesson. So a uh, basic summary, um, when we heat something up, we're giving it heat, we're transferring heat into it. This increases the temperature, it increases the internal energy of the object. When two objects are brought into thermal contact, heat will flow from the one with a higher temperature to the one with a lower temperature until the two objects reach thermal equilibrium. We have defined the quantities that we're going to be using in this topic. However, we still need to clearly explain how we're going to measure temperature. And there are two commonly used temperature scale, Celsius and Kelvin. And Kelvin is the one more commonly used in physics. Celsius is the one more commonly used in everyday language uh, because Celsius has a temperature scale uh, of 0 to 100 in the types of temperatures that we're, we usually deal with in everyday life. So the Celsius scale takes zero degrees to be the freezing point of pure water at a pressure of one atmosphere, so that's at sea level. It defines 100 as the boiling point of pure water at a pressure of one atmosphere, and the interval between zero and 100 on a thermometer is divided up into 100 equal un units. Um, and so uh, we, we discussed a bit in class and how, how, we, how you can build a thermometer um, and, we, we, and how you can make use of the expansion of a, of, a, of a fluid to build a thermometer. The Kelvin scale is the scale that we use most commonly in physics and it's the same as the Celsius scale ex except that it has a different zero point. It takes zero degrees to be the point at which no further heat can be removed from a substance. And this is called absolute zero, 
and has a value of negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. And um, because we usually deal with problems involving no more than three significant figures in this topic, we can take that to be roughly negative 273. And so we can convert between the Celsius and Kelvin scales using the equation the temperature in Kelvin is equal to the temperature in Celsius plus 273. So for example, 0 degrees Celsius will be 273 degrees Kelvin. Room temperature, which is maybe about 20 degrees Celsius, would be 293 Kelvin. And we don't say degrees Kelvin, we just say Kelvin. And so um, the ability to measure, temperature is a measurable quantity, an easily measurable quantity. The other a aspects like internal energy and heat and so forth, they're more difficult to measure, but they can be related back to the temperature, which is easily measurable. So the idea that we can measure the temperature is very important uh, in the field of thermal physics and thermodynamics.